Well, good morning, everybody, and a happy new year to all. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm very happy to connect with you again. It has been a moment, hasn't it? This is our first webinar of 2022, and we will be discussing a very important and time relevant topic regarding how to engage consumers in their healthcare. I believe you all know me, but once again, I'm Melina Kambitsi. I'm the Senior Vice President for Business Development and Strategic Marketing here at the Alliance. We're excited to have 222 people listening on today's webinar. You are all on mute mode, but we do wanna hear from you. Please use the chat feature to ask your questions. Please note that handouts from today's event will be made available on the events page on our website, and we'll email a link to all attendees uh, next week. You can also access them by clicking the handouts uh, dropdown. Today's keynote speaker and panelists will be talking about the best practices to engage employees in their health, a topic we know is very important to our employers. But first, let me welcome our sponsors and thank them. Uh, National Cooperative Rx and Delta Dental, thank you very much for helping us and our employers in this very important educational event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you all Dr. Jessica Grossmeyer. Jessica, will you join on camera with us while I introduce you? Good morning. So Dr. Grossmeyer is a workplace well-being thought leader with more than 25 years of experience advancing workplace well-being. Her research focuses on identifying best practice approaches to workplace well-being initiatives associated with superior health and business outcomes. She currently advises employers and those who serve their workplace well-being needs. Jessica is a friend of Wisconsin. She has worked with several employers and organizations in Wisconsin to empower them on how to engage their workforce in healthcare and wellness. We look forward to her presentation as we know this is a topic all employers and us at the Alliance are hoping to learn more about, particularly early in the year as we are now, and we're all implementing wellness programs and steerage to high value providers. Thank you for being here today, Jessica, and we will turn it over to you now. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, thank you, Melina, for that lovely introduction. And thanks for all of you for joining me and this session. As a former Midwesterner with family living in the Madison area, I have a warm place in my heart for the work that you're all doing at the Alliance with employers. And as we prepared for our time together today, it was evident to me that we have a shared passion for using evidence-based best practice approaches to employee health and well-being. So I'm delighted to be here to share some recent research that I've done around our topic today. And I will also be um, applying some of those research findings to practice as we go along. But before we do so, I do want to um, get a poll, get a check-in of how your organizations are doing in terms of employee engagement in their own health and well-being. And so this is a check all that apply poll, and you can select if your employees are putting off health, preventive health actions, if you get a sense that they're not participating in wellness programs, that the offerings seem to be appreciated, appreciated by employees, but interest is waning in them. Or are you finding that employees are prioritizing their well-being and self-care? If you're not sure you're not measuring or you don't feel this question applies to you, there is an option for that as well. But please go ahead and enter your results into the poll and we'll just get a sense here for how everybody is doing in terms of our topic today. I, I don't think you can see Jessica, but uh, responses are pouring in. So I'm just gonna give this uh, 15 more seconds. Great. It's great that we have so many people joining us today. This will give me a great pulse for how things are going in the Midwest.
And so in terms of results here, thanks for displaying those, it looks like we, we do have some struggles in terms of um, a majority of you are, are, are indicating that you're having some struggles with interest waning or people not participating. So you're in the right place today <laughs> because we're gonna talk about this. So thank you so much for sharing those insights about where you are with this topic. So in terms of the next 45 minutes, um, we'll be covering these topics. I wanna to start by setting the context for how the pandemic and our current circumstances have influenced employee engagement and their well-being. So I'll be sharing some somewhat recent data on what we're seeing. Um, we also need to do a sidebar because we need to talk about what it means to engage employees in their own health and well-being. In research, how you define engagement matters because it influences what you see for results. So we do need to talk a little bit about that. But then the majority of our session will talk about how we actually engage employees in their own health and well-being. And we're going to start with the use of financial incentives because that's probably the most um, popular strategy that employers are using. And there's actually quite a bit of research to help us understand what works and what doesn't. Um, and then we'll talk about other best practices to support engagement and health. And I'll be sharing some research that I've done around this as well. We'll end with some tools to support um, your applying the research to practice. And then um, as time allows, we'll get into some applications for how does this apply to hybrid work arrangements. Um, as we go on, please do um, enter your questions and we will be leaving time at the end to address those. So thank you for those in advance. So let's dive right into the current context. So I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anyone that there is increased interest in mental and emotional well-being among employees. Um, the pandemic has created life-changing, life-altering circumstances for everybody. Those who were knowledge workers and are primarily working from home are experiencing increased isolation and depression, loneliness. Um, we're also seeing that people who report to work every day are, are seeing some increased anxiety because they, they just don't feel safe going to work in some cases. And so we know that employees are interested in mental and emotional well-being. And I think the COVID pandemic and the, the circumstances we find ourselves in in this nation have really intensified the interest in this. And as a result, employers are investing more in mental and emotional well-being services. Um, you can see on this figure on the right side of the slide that more than 80% of employers have upped their offerings for mental health, stress management, resilience, and of course telemedicine because a lot of people are engaging digitally in the offerings. And what might be interesting for you to know is that while employee interest in mental and emotional well-being has increased, a recent McKinsey survey of employees suggested that only 50% felt that their employers were supporting their mental and emotional well-being needs. In terms of other ways to engage in health, there's also use of the healthcare system and health behaviors. So a recent study of office workers, who these were all work, working from home, reported less physical activity, increased food take, intake, and that was primarily increased junk food intake, and less attention to their ergonomic work situation. Um, all of the employees who reported these, this, these decreases in health behaviors reported less, um, they, they reported poorer well-being, and um, they also had more injuries, especially with the ergonomics. In terms of preventive exams, we saw substantial decreases in use of mammograms, pap smears, and PSA tests, as well as colonoscopies. Now, we did see some recovery as things began to open back up with the mammograms, pap smears, and PSA tests, but colonoscopies have remained 25% lower than pre-pandemic levels. So we are seeing some challenges there. But then what about employer offerings? What about the, the programs and services that you're offering at the workplace? Well, as you can see on this figure in the dark pink, those are the percent of organizations who say they're offering physical well-being, financial well-being, mental and emotional well-being services. But then in the light bars, you see employees using them. And so we see that 23 to 32% of employees are using the services available to them. And so how do we effectively engage people in the offerings that are available? Before we get into that though, let's talk about what it means to engage employees in their health and well-being. 
so an uh, organization called the Health Enhancement Research Organization engaged a study committee to review the research on what employee engagement actually means and how to measure it. And I share this information with you, again, because how you measure it influences how you interpret the research and what you're going to see. But then it also helps inform how you are measuring your um, employee engagement rates in your own organization. And it can also help you to think differently as you look at vendor supplier reports on participation and engagement. So that is how you can apply some of this information. And what they found after reviewing over 200 articles on the topic of employee engagement, they said there's no consensus definition in either participation or engagement. Everybody's defining it differently. And that makes it really hard to benchmark against other employers and to really understand, well, am I, how am I doing compared to other people? And so I know that this is a frustration. One thing that the committee did agree on is that participation and engagement are related, but two very different concepts, and that engagement, it, it, it represents a deeper commitment to health and well-being. When they looked across all of the definitions that they found in the research, they landed on the one at the bottom. It's, it's a personal commitment to optimize one's health and well-being, and so there's some action that's being taken to demonstrate that commitment, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. This committee also um, did an additional follow-on study where they looked at, well, what, what actually influences employee engagement in their health and well-being? So let's look at however they defined it. Let's look at the research that helps us understand how we can influence these measures. And they found that there were six different types of influencers. There are health-related factors. We know that as employees experience acute health issues, they're more likely to engage in the offerings available to them when they know about them and when they can access them. We also know that employee demographics have a role to play. Age, gender, racial, and ethnicity, those can all be demographics that influence how employees engage in certain kinds of programs. The remainder of them are all things that employers can really influence. So organizational factors can include things like leadership support behaviors, and we'll be talking about what those are. Um, employee perceptions about their employer, if there's trust there or not between employer and employee, that makes a difference. Perceived supervisory support for employees' health and well-being and other factors like that. We know that financial incentives, of course, are something that influence participation and engagement, and we'll be talking about that next. And then there are environmental factors, and these can include things like perceived social support and what's going on in the environment at the workplace. And then, of course, communications are a big influencer. So at the end of the day, there are a lot of different factors that influence employee engagement in their health, and that's the good news because that means that there are a lot of tools that you can use to try to influence this. As we get into um, measurement of participation and engagement, there was another initiative that HERO launched in conjunction with the Population Health Alliance, and this was over 60 organizations that were coming together to say, well, let's, let's develop a consensus around how ought we be measuring participation? Now, there's a whole chapter in this guide on participation, not engagement, because this group recognized they're not the same thing, but everybody we know is measuring participation, not necessarily engagement. So let's start there with participation. And so they do provide some guidance in this guide on how to measure participation rates. And what they do is, is they don't say there's any one specific measure of participation. Instead, they recommend a range of measures be used. And these can include things like help us understand not just are people enrolling in something, but how many times are they being touched by a specific offering? How many contacts do they have with the offering? And what kinds of delivery modalities are being used? And how do the participation rates change according to modality? So in terms of guidance on, on measuring engagement, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about during my 20-some years in this field. And, you know, I do agree with, with what's been said here, that engagement is deeper than enrollment or participation. And so when we talk about engagement, we have to think about, well, what does it mean to have that deeper demonstration of commitment? And some suggestions are, again, use multiple measures. Yes, you might want to look at enrollment or registration rates, but then also look at how many people completed more than one action. And that could be within a specific offering, or it can be across all of your offerings. So you could look at, if you can integrate all of the participation data, you can say, well, across every single offering, how many people actually engaged in more than one thing? And then you could also look at available actions. So if you had, for example, a six-session weekly 
um, workshop, you could say, well, what percent actually did all six? And so you have like more of a genuine completion right there. And then of course, you can look a little bit further out from that and say, well, how many people are actually demonstrating increased knowledge, skills, or behavior change as a result of these? That's a deeper level of commitment and engagement than just mere participation. So not just did they show up, but are they actually taking action based on that? And then finally, in the population health field, we like to use something called reach rates. And so oftentimes when you look at a vendor supplier's report, you're going to see the percent of the eligible population that was reached. And that might be a subset of your broader population because maybe it's a targeted offering. Maybe only um, people who are, are at high risk for obesity or diabetes are engaged in or eligible for a particular program. And so it's helpful to look at of those who are eligible, what percent were reached. But then you also need to look at, well, what about our whole population? What percent of the entire population that we're serving is actually getting some dose of what it is we're providing? And this is important because you can see phenomenal success in an individual program, but that's not gonna translate into population level or enterprise level results if, for example, only 2% of your entire population was actually engaged in a targeted offering. So in public health, we often like to look at both. Let's look at of the percent eligible and then the reach rate across the entire population. So let's get into what we really want to talk about, and that's how do we engage employees. And so we're going to start with um, the research on incentives. I think that this is, again, one of the most popular strategies used by employers, but I think it's probably also somewhat misunderstood. So we're going to start here again with a check-in um, and a poll. So let us know how your organization is using financial incentives to encourage participation in health and well-being programs. The top selection is we're primarily um, giving people incentives if they participate or show up or they're making some sort of healthy action. Um, you can also select making progress towards or achievement of health outcomes. If you're using a combination of both of those strategies, you're giving some incentives for participation and some for health outcomes or achievement of health outcomes, you can select the combination selection. And then we have, we don't offer any financial incentives to encourage participation. And then if you don't feel like you represent any of these or you don't feel like this question applies to you, select other. And once we have a majority of people selecting their options, we'll check in and see how everyone is doing with financial incentives. Yep, they're, they're still pouring in. Gonna give it another 10 seconds. Yep. Gives me an opportunity to have a sip of tea. Okay, what are we seeing for results? 35% for participation. And we're seeing 18% um, combination. 32% are not offering incentives to encourage participation. And I actually have to say bravo that you're finding other strategies because I think, and sometimes incentives can be overused um, to encourage participation. Um, so thanks so much for sharing that. That gives me a sense for, for how we're doing in terms of um, participation and incentives. So, what we know from the research on incentives is about half of organizations across the nation use incentives to encourage participation in health and well-being initiatives at the workplace. If you're a smaller organization, you're less likely to use incentives. If you're larger, you're more likely than this 53%. But this is the benchmarking data that I've seen most recently. Um, financial incentives that promote participation are actually pretty effective for simple behaviors. That is health assessment surveys, preventive exams, biometric screenings, flu shots, you know, one and done kind of behaviors that people are doing. Financial incentives actually, assuming that there's no access issues, are actually pretty effective. We do know that there's some effectiveness for incentives in promoting short term improvements in physical activity and reduced tobacco use, usually in, in conjunction with a behavior change program to help people build the skills to do that. Um, we're seeing though that. For other kinds of behaviors, there isn't as strong a research base for those yet. And then, as I said earlier, age, gender, and health status of individuals does influence participation, but we also know that those factors influence how people are likely to respond to different kinds of incentives. 
In fact, the University of Michigan found that there were such dramatic differences across their employee population, they started to allow um, some people to make choices about the kind of incentive they received for the same behaviors. Other research tells us that the more you pay, the more they play. <laughs> higher dollar valued incentives are generally tied to higher participation rates. But if you do nothing at all, participation does tend to diminish over time. So it's not a long-term sustainable strategy for most organizations. We also know that there's very little research supporting the effectiveness of incentives on long-term sustained behavior change and health outcomes. And a study I'm going to show you next actually looked underneath the hood to try to understand that a little bit better because there is some research, but not a lot of research on this. And then we know that incentive strategies must be complemented by other strategies to promote population level engagement. So we're going to talk about what some of those other strategies are. But first, let's talk a little bit more about incentives. So we know that the higher the value you offer, um, the more likely you are to get participation. And this study looked at 36 employers, and we divided those 36 employers into three groups depending on what type of incentive strategy or what type of incentive they were using. Uh, it could be a non-financial incentive like gym bags or water bottles. It could be cash incentives, gift cards or payroll, or it could be benefits integrated incentives such as a differential on your healthcare premiums based on your participation. The outcome we looked at here was specifically health risk assessment survey participation rates. So easy behavior to track, easy behavior to, to complete if you're a participant. And what we found is for every level of incentive, for every single type of incentive, there were other factors that influenced how effective they were at producing participation. So the darker bars represent organizations that had a stronger communication strategy or a worksite culture. And then the lighter bars are those that had a weaker communication strategy and a weaker worksite culture. And what you can see from this chart is that organizations that had stronger communications and culture actually had a higher performing incentive for the same kind of incentive being offered. And so we know that it's not just the incentive, but what are you wrapping around the incentive that matters? The next study dug into this more deeply, and this is a more recent study published last year. And we looked at the influence of incentive design and organizational characteristics to try to get more deeply into some of what we found in that earlier study. And we were looking at a variety of outcomes here. We were looking at participation in a couple of different components of wellness programs. And then we we're also looking at health outcomes at a population level. What we found is this was about 800 some organizations and we divided them into four different patterns that we saw in the data. So they gave us time over time data that showed us at the start of the study, at the baseline, what type of incentive strategy was being used. And then over time, they changed it. How did they change it over time? And what we found is actually employers are monkeying with their incentive design pretty much every year. Sometimes it's just increasing the amount of incentive offered. Sometimes it's it's shifting how that's being delivered. Um, but these are bigger changes. So if you look at the left side of the slide in that pink hexagon, um, that was the group of 24% of the sample that started with a primarily a participation-based strategy and then shifted to outcomes-based. The next group, 17% of the 800 some employers, um, started with a combination approach where they were providing some incentives for participation and some for outcomes, and then they stuck with that strategy over time. The next group over primarily started and ended with a health improvement or outcomes focused incentive. And then for the last group, they pretty much start and stuck with a participation based incentive design. So what did we find? This is a very detailed <laughs> set of findings. I'm going to start at the top row and go down. And so what we found when we looked at the culture of health, so culture of health was measured, we were looking at things like, do you have a strategic plan for your wellness program? Do you, um, what are you doing for program implementation? What kinds of organizational supports do you offer in terms of leadership support and communications? What other types of strategies are you using to help promote these different types of um, offerings? And so we took all of the answers to those questions, there were about 10 of them, and we created a culture of health score or an index. And so what we looked at then is we simply observed, based on your incentive design, 
what type of culture of health score did you have? And what we found is organizations who were using a combination of strategies, they had the highest culture of health score. Those who were using primarily outcomes focused had a lower, the lowest culture of health score. And that told us that they were really relying on a high accountability model to support participation. The other two groups had modest scores for culture of health. The reason I share this is not because there, there's necessarily a correlation between the culture of health and incentive design, although I think there could be. We didn't examine that in the study. All we're doing here is simply observing in combination with the incentive design, what was the culture of health? Because we know that both things are important. And then we also looked at the value of the incentive offer. And it turns out employers with certain kinds of strategies offered higher or lower amounts of incentive. So the outcomes focused folks tended to offer the highest amount of incentive potential for people. And the combination was about half that amount. And then the other two groups had still less than the combination group. How did these three factors, the design of the incentive, the culture of health score, and the value of the incentive offer influence participation? What we found here is actually a mixed set of findings. We found that the outcomes focused group had the highest participation rates in those simple behaviors, health assessment surveys, biometrics, and screenings. And they decreased over time, those participation rates. For the combination group, they had the second highest participation rates for about half the incentive cost. And they actually found that participation rates in health assessment surveys and screenings improved over time. And then in the other two groups, we saw that there were um, less levels of participation and both of those decreased in participation over time. We also looked separately at participation in health behavior change interventions, which I think demonstrates a deeper level of commitment to health and well-being because oftentimes this is multi-session, it might be multiple sessions with a coach or a workshop, so it takes more effort. And what we found is that there were some significant differences here in terms of how these three factors influence participation. What we found is that the highest participation rate was for the organizations that started with a participation focused strategy and shifted to outcomes. And they were able to maintain those levels of participation over time with a modest incentive offering and a pretty modest culture of health score. We found that the very lowest participation rates in behavior change was the outcomes focused group with the lower health, culture of health score and the highest amount of incentive offerings. And they actually were so low that they really didn't have anywhere to go. So they maintained those low participation rates over time, but they were practically zero in behavior change interventions, which I found very intriguing. The second highest participation rate was for the combination group. Those participation rates did decrease over time, um, but we did see that they had the second highest for a more modest incentive. And so what this helps us understand is that you have to look at more than one of these factors when you look at your incentive design. How does this translate into outcomes? Well, what we found here is probably the most winning strategy was that combination incentive strategy combined with a high culture of health score and a modest level of incentive. They had the most improvement in blood pressure and cholesterol risk at a population level, and they had significant improvement in glucose. For obesity risk, there was a non-significant increase in obesity risk over the duration of the study. And by the way, all of the organizations that were measuring these were using biometric screenings as the way to measure these things. Um, the second probably highest performing group here was the participation to outcomes group with a modest culture of health score and modest incentive offering. They had significant improvement in blood pressure and cholesterol, the most in glucose, and also a non-significant increase in obesity. The other two groups didn't do as well with a very mixed bag of results. And in fact, the outcomes focus group significantly increased their obesity risk over time. And you know, you might look at, well, non-significant increase, what does that mean? We know that if you do nothing at all, obesity risk in a population tends to go up over time. We see that in the national trends. So a non-significant increase means that they held the risk levels flat for obesity risk. And that's actually a pretty big win from a population level health perspective. So um, that's actually what we, we consider to be a pretty good um, outcome. So how do we apply all this research to practice? Well, we know that if you're going to use a financial incentive, it works best when you're supporting that with some organizational commitment to a culture of health. And this can mean things like senior leadership support, having a comprehensive communication strategy, 
having a written strategic plan, and measurable objectives for well-being programs. We're going to get into some more ways that organizations can support culture of health in a moment, but just to finish out this, this incentives research, we know that a combination of participation and health-related objectives are associated with higher levels of participation over time. And so this helps us to understand, well, let's give people multiple offerings because if you're looking only at health outcomes, people might feel like there's no way I'm ever going to achieve those and they just kind of check out and think, well, this stuff isn't for me. If you offer a combination of participation and health outcomes, it gives some offering to get people engaged in health and well-being, even if they feel like they're not going to meet the health outcomes targets that are set. So it gives more of the population more options to earn the incentive. If you're looking for more guidance on how to design effective incentives, I am going to refer you to a couple of resources and the link is on the lower left side of the slide. All of these resources can be found there. And what they represent is consensus guidance. So this is across a variety of organizations, including the Health Enhancement Research Organization, American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, and the others you see listed in that top box. They all came together and said, well, we were going to provide guidance for employers on how to design an outcomes-based incentive so that it promotes deeper levels of engagement and health outcomes. How would we recommend those be designed? So if you're looking for that kind of guidance, I would highly recommend going to this resource. They um, go into it in detail in this consensus paper, which was published in the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine. But then they also translated that into a fact sheet with 10 tips for employers on developing outcomes-based incentives. And even though this was published in 2012, I looked over the fact sheet and I feel like all 10 of the recommendations still hold true today based on the research that's been done since that time. A more recent consensus paper was developed and published in 2016 by the same organizations that were involved in the 2012 consensus, but this was specifically in response to EEOC um, reservations and concerns about employer use of incentives as part of their well-being initiatives. So if you're interested in what these cons this consensus group had to say about some of those concerns, you can go and look at that paper. It's not written for employers, but it does have some applicable takeaways for employers in it. So let's talk more about culture of health. The incentive studies mentioned this concept, and the term gets tossed around a lot, but what does it mean? So we did a study that looked at the well-being factors that predicted four different outcomes, employee participation in different types of things, health impact at a population level, medical cost impact at a population level, and then employee perceptions about how their organization was supporting their health and well-being. And those were typically tracked on surveys that employers did. And so what we did is we used the Hero Scorecard, which is a free online survey tool that any one of you could go out and do after today's session. And the link to that is on the very bottom of the slide there. This free survey tool gives you a list, an inventory of the practices that industry thought leaders and researchers say are more likely to lead you to have a more, more effective health and well-being initiative. And this includes domains like what should you do to increase participation and what does it mean to have an organizational support for health and well-being, that culture of health that we've been talking about. So this is the survey tool that we use to get a sense for what the employers in the study were actually doing to promote health and well-being. And then we looked at those four different outcomes. We had about 800 studies who complete, or 800 companies who completed the survey in um, the time frame that we were looking at. And what we found is that it represented a wide diversity of organizations. About a third were small employers with less than 500 employees. 24%, about a quarter of the sample, had 5,000 or more employees. Um, we found that the organizations were distributed quite, um, quite evenly across the nation. And we found that 20% of the organizations were manufacturing industry. The majority, 58%, were service industry, and that could be things like education, healthcare, professional services like insurance, et cetera. And then um, other was 20% of the sample. What did we find? What we found is that the 10 best practices that drove all four of the outcomes to the highest levels were these 10 practices, and they all have to do with organizational and leadership support. And so if you go around the outside of the yellow circle in the text are the 
domains of the 10 practices. So there's more detail if you go out to the hero scorecard under each one of these. So for example, on the lower left, you see that 95% bubble. That means that 95% of the employers say that they support at least one health-related policy. So there's a question on the hero scorecard that asks, which one of these health-related policies do you use? And people check all the ones that they have. And so if you go out to the scorecard, it can give you a sense for, well, what are the recommended policies that we provide to support employee health and well-being? And what this says is that 95% supported at least one of the listed health-related policies on the scorecard. But it also says that it's one of the predictive factors for supporting the outcomes that we looked at. We also knew that employers who use and support employee champion networks or ambassadors to promote well-being was a driver of success, but only half of organizations use that strategy. 46% use targeted communications to help specific employee groups understand what's available to them. More employers engage employees in health and well-being in at least one way, and that is very vague, so you'll have to go to the survey to look at that. I also want to mention that there is a handout associated with this session, and it's in the um, control panel for this session. will also be provided on the website, as Melina mentioned, after today's session. But that handout is actually a list, a more detailed description of each of these 10 best practices and what that looks like when you translate those practices into a real world setting. So I highly encourage you to go and look at that handout to better understand what these 10 practices are that support a culture of health and well-being. These free tools are available for you to determine if you're using a best practice approach to your health and well-being initiatives, including participation. And so the new version of the HERO scorecard, you can see what that looks like on the left there and the link to get to it. This has now been updated in the past year to include some of the emerging issues that employers are trying to address, such as how do we integrate and support health and well-being using diversity, equity, and inclusion practices? What's the relationship there? What about addressing what we're calling social determinants of health, the life circumstances that employees exist within, which also influence their health and well-being? What can the employers do to support employees who have some of those life circumstances that make it challenging, such as housing issues or transportation issues. There's also quite a bit of added information in this version on how to address em employee mental and emotional well being. There's also the CDC Worksite Health Scorecard. That is a much more detailed survey, it's much longer and it's modularized. Um, what I like about the CDC survey, one, it's free <laughs> and it is research based, so there's a lot of overlap between these two scorecards. The HERO scorecard is more um, high level strategy. So it might ask, for example, if you have a tobacco policy, the CDC scorecard actually tells you these are the actual practices we recommend when it comes to having a tobacco policy. Here are the aspects of your tobacco policy we recommend based on the research. So these two tools are free and available to anybody to go and complete and determine how you're doing. How do we apply some of this to the workplace today? I'm just going to address this at a very high level because I know you've got some amazing panelists coming to also talk about some strategies to apply this information. But let's talk a little bit about how to apply culture of health best practices. I think one of the biggest opportunities that we have in the employer well-being space is to provide managers and supervisors with more training, more support, and resources, not only to support their own health and well-being, but also to foster well-being for their teams, helping them to understand that they have a critical role to play in translating the what's being offered at the organizational level to their teams and the people that they supervise. Because oftentimes, the employer might be offering a lot of different things, but the employee doesn't feel like they have permission or support from their frontline leader to actually take advantage of those things. And so I think it's important for managers and supervisors to understand they have a critical role to play in influencing employee health and well-being. They also need to be taking care of their own well-being and role modeling that for people so that they get a sense, oh, this is actually something my employer cares about and it's something I'm being encouraged to do as an employee. So that's a strategy that I think is really, really important. Um, encouraging leaders at all levels, not just managers and supervisors, to role model self-care is extremely important. And I think 
you know, a lot of times we see from the research that employees, they say, well, yeah, my employer is offering this or they have this policy or this program, but I don't feel like I'm really encouraged to take advantage of that. I don't feel like I have permission to do that. So it's important for um, managers and supervisors, senior leaders at all levels to role model by participating in the programs and the offerings themselves. We're seeing some, um, especially during the pandemic, they were actually being very vulnerable and creating videos that all employees saw that helped them understand, oh, this is a well-being issue that my leader is dealing with due to the pandemic. They're human too. I think that's an important message. Um, but then also they can talk about, these are the strategies I use and this is what helped me to become a better version of myself and show up in the world the way I want to. And so I think it's really important for leaders at all levels to show that vulnerability and help employees understand, look, everybody needs well-being. It's not just for some, it's for everyone. And the journey to get to well-being is going to be different for everybody, but let's all get on that journey together. You can also start to incorporate movement into your on-site and virtual meetings. I know that walking meetings were very popular before the pandemic. What about taking some movement breaks and incorporating that into your longer meetings? Um, incorporating mindful moments is something that more organizations are doing just to give people sort of a break to ground themselves. They'll start an on-site or a virtual meeting with just a one minute pause and just allow people to breathe deeply or sit in silence. Um, supporting flexible work schedules and prioritizing short breaks is something that I see a lot more employers doing as we're coming through um, the current stage of the pandemic because they realize people are just burnt out and fried and they need a break. So how are they allowing people to flex their schedules to take care of things like child care needs and um, maybe even in-home um, elder care support? We also know that relationship building and developing meaningful connections at work are very important. And one of the things I think that especially managers and supervisors can do is to start building that relationship building into the actual workday. So people have a lot of meetings. When you're connecting with people and you're actually talking about things that are going on at work, make some time to get away from just the day-to-day -day transactional stuff of getting the job done and actually connect with people on a personal level. This can be as something as simple as, hey, you were on vacation, how did it go? Did you have a good time? Or it could be um, you know, sharing how people celebrated a certain holiday. Um, you know, we know that, especially as people work from home and were on camera a lot, we started to see things like people's pets and we saw their kids in the background and their family in the background. We saw who has plants or certain kinds of artwork. And that allows us to humanize one another and actually approach one another with our fuller sense of self. And by sharing those things, it allows us to build relationship at work and build connections in a deeper way. So making time for that and being intentional can be really helpful. And then it's really important to get employee feedback on what feels supportive to them. Everybody's different. And so using the employee surveys or focus groups or simply asking people during one-on-ones what will feel supportive to their health and well-being can go a long way towards actually encouraging people to use some of the services that are available to them. In terms of some programming ideas that I've seen before we go to questions, um, these are not necessarily things that there's a lot of research underneath, although I think research would support a lot of these, uh, but they're things that I'm seeing employers do to adjust their programming for the hybrid workplace. And I think one of the things that's most important is if you have a mix of employees, some who are going to work every day or part of the week, and then you have some who are at home all the time, make sure you're offering something robust for both groups of employees. Um, we see a lot of organizations who are going 100% digital, but that doesn't work for some on-site workers who may not have access to a computer at home or lousy bandwidth or Wi-Fi. So we need to make sure that we're offering something robust for the employees who are coming into work every day and those who are working from home and not allowing one group to feel like, well, there's nothing for me because it's all either on-site or it's all digital. So make sure you're providing something for a variety of different settings. Also, um, if you are offering digital solutions, um, the arena events where you have everybody participating, like today where we have over 100 people, are great. But if you have the opportunity to offer one-on-one -on -one digital solutions with your wellness programs, that's a really key thing. So, for, for example, you could offer video one-on-one -on -one coaching. That's an easy example of that. And if you do have the larger group settings, using the different platforms to break people up into smaller groups can actually help build more connection and support for people in health and well-being and engage them more deeply in an offering 
if they're able to actually talk about and apply what they're learning. It's really important to reduce barriers to participation. And if you're not sure what those are, you have to ask your employees what's making it hard for them to participate. And I know that you know a lot of times people say, well, we have these one hour webinars. For some people, being on screen all day is, is, is a challenge. And then to ask them to do another hour to participate in a wellness offering can be a lot. Maybe breaking out some of that content into shorter chunks into 20 minute or 30 minute modules is a way to get people to engage more because now they don't lose their entire lunch hour, for example. Now they can actually just take part of the time and, and participate in a wellness offering. And maybe it's instead of one full hour, it's three 20 minute modules that they can participate in. That's just one example. Um, if you have a lot of video sessions, give people an opportunity to participate with cameras turned off. I'm seeing a lot of encouragement to say, oh, you know, let's all see each other. And that's great because it does build connection. But there's also video fatigue. And this is a real documented thing. There's research to support this. So allowing people to participate with their videos turned off is really important to them because that might make the difference between them showing up for the session or not showing up. Another thing I'm seeing employers doing is they're taking part of their wellness budget and they're offering a wellness reimbursement or allowance. And it gives the opportunity for the employee to say, well, this is something I want to participate in, and they can use that reimbursement or allowance to pay for that. So if it's a local level offering, something that's offered in their community, they can use that for something that they really want to participate in, but they would have to pay out of pocket. And there are a lot of other examples of things that are available digitally, like, for example, there are um, exercise um, apps that you can get or different types of meditation apps. And it might be helpful for the employer to subsidize or to pay for or reimburse for some of those subscription services. And it allows the employee to say, well, this is what I want to do. This is what's going to support my well-being. Also, make sure that your offerings are relevant to worker interests. And if you're not sure, ask them. But I'm seeing popular offerings such as kindness, gratitude. We're seeing um, mindfulness increase more. A lot of things addressing mental and emotional well-being at work. And then we're also seeing, for example, things like ergonomics. How do I make sure that my workspace is set up well if I'm going to work at home longer term? So those are some examples. I think we'll hear a lot more from the panel <laughs> when they come on, and I'm looking forward to hearing those as well. But now I'd like to check in with all of you and see if you have any questions for me um, about some of the content. And Melina, I'm going to turn that over to you to uh, guide us through questions. Yes, thank you so very much. It was riveting, Jessica. I mean, I know I had seen the presentation before. I had read it. I had studied it. But this was riveting. And thank you so very much for all the resources you made available to us. That is phenomenal. That makes a, a great difference um, in the webinar. Uh, we do have a very engaged audience. And so I have lots of questions for you. So if you don't mind, I will start with um, the first question we have from the audience. How do you motivate unengaged employees to focus on um, health and, and overall wellness. Uh, so you gave us a lot, of, a lot of tactics and strategies for those that may be more engaged. Are there specific things we can do with unengaged employees? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad that that question was asked because there is actually a lot that we're finding to increase individual motivation. And what we're finding from the research is it's relying less on extrinsic motivators like incentives and relying more or in addition to um, incentives, also relying on building intrinsic motivation. And there's actually a lot of research on how to build intrinsic motivation. Um, it can be things such as helping people to think about how do I connect my well being with what's important to me in the world? What's my reason for getting out of bed in the morning? What matters most to me? And so these are questions related to purpose and what you value and who is important to you in your life. And so if you can start to look at, you know, those different motivations for people and then connect health and well-being with their larger purpose, research shows that that actually works. I've seen this demonstrated in work sites around the what's your why initiatives where they'll engage employees and saying, what's your why? why you know, what, what is it about um, health and well-being that helps you to be your best in the world? And how can you connect? your health and well-being habits with your, your greatest why. And so you start to see employees sharing what's their why. They can do these in videos. They can do these in newsletters. 
Um, at the work site, I've seen people do a what's your why campaign where they have a big whiteboard and people come up and they write their why or they post a picture of their why. Um, so these are different ways that we can help people to tap into what matters most to me as an individual. And then how does investing in my own health and well-being help me to show up in the world so that I can live out my why strongly? So I could give a whole hour presentation on the research on this, but I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so very much. Yes. So we talked, you talked a lot about organizational commitment to the culture of health. Um, I believe that we all hear you and agree with you. You also mentioned senior leadership support, ongoing communications, measurable objectives. Do you have any specific examples of how senior leadership can participate and show support? And of course, which communication channels you think may be working best uh, in, in your research for people? Yeah, so I'm going to answer the communication strategies first. And I think that what we've learned is that communications are different for every single population. And so if you're using a one size fits all communication strategy for your population, one of the most effective things that we're seeing, and it's one of the 10 best practices, is to actually take your whole population and try to break them into different groups. So if, for example, you're in an education setting, you've got teachers or faculty, you've got um, staff who are supporting them, you might have other different groups, and they engage differently. And so you might need to use a targeted communication strategy to create messages that use language that is going to work for them. So the messaging might be a little bit different for these different groups or how you deliver the message. Some people like email, some people don't. Some people would rather see a poster at the workplace or they might want something sent to home. And so it really takes understanding your population and breaking down the population into subgroups and then understanding how do we communicate most effectively with them. And you could use, if you have employee champion networks, you could use those types of networks to understand how do different pockets of employees respond to different kinds of communications. There are also companies, communication companies and marketing companies that do this really, really well, and they can help you with this strategy. Going back to what leaders can do, um, I already mentioned role modeling, and I think that that is so important. You know, we see leaders and they'll say, oh, you know, don't, you know, totally unplug during your vacation, or I don't want to see emails on the weekend. But then they're breaking their own rule, and they're using email all the time, all hours of day and night, and they're also emailing on vacation. I think it's really important for leaders to pay attention to when they're communicating about health and well-being offering that they're also walking the talk themselves. And so if it's, you know, I, for example, had a boss at a former organization and every once in a while he would say, you know what, the water's great. I want to go out and get my, he rode competitively. And he's like, I want to go out and I want to get on the water while the water is perfect for rowing. Can we reschedule our call? And I was like, sure, that's fine. Let's just, let's bump it to earlier or whatever. But that said to me, wow, health and well-being is really important to my leader. He's taking time out of his work day to actually go and hit the water while the water is good for rowing. That means I can take, you know, they give me permission. I'm going to go and take a walk during my lunch hour or I'm going to do a walking call. It helped me to feel like I had permission. So I think role modeling is really, really important. You can also take a look as a leader at your policies and how those are being translated into the workplace. Um, I think flex time is, is something that we've seen really be effective and look at how can we adjust, allow, allow employees to adjust their work schedules so that they can fit health and well-being into their day. We're also seeing more and more employers allowing employees to participate during paid work time in some of these offerings and I think that's really, really important. So those are just some strategies and if you go to the handout that's provided with this session, there are, there's more detail on how leaders can support um, health and well-being for their employees. So Cindy, uh, Cindy, um, I, we have questions from Cindy coming up. So Cindy, I promise you, um, I have your questions. Jessica, um, I, with the fear of getting us into a rabbit hole, and I, I don't intend to do that. So we, we talk a lot about employees. What about their families? What about their spouses? Have you, um, do you have any thoughts to share with us on how to engage spouses? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked. As a spouse of my, my um, husband, he actually carries our primary health insurance and he, his company has quite a few health and well-being offerings. As a spouse who's in the wellness field, I'm always like, 
what's available to me? What can I get? And, you know, the interesting thing is, as much as this employer is doing to invest in programs and services, there's no communication of spouses about what those are. And I would love it if an employer would actually send me some information on what is available to me. Um, and I think, you know, some of it is get the information into the home and allow specifically for the spouse to figure out how they can access those services. Specifically, when you are dealing with older male employees, many times the partner in the household is the one that is sort of responsible for the family's health and well-being. And so they can be a, they can be a strategic ally for you to get the older males engaged, but they have to know how to do that. And if they don't even know what's offered or what's available, that can make it hard. Um, I think it starts with understanding how do we contact people, and so you do need good contact information. And it could be as part of benefits enrollment, having an opt-in where the spouse can say, oh, I agree to allow text messages or emails or home mailings and provide the contact information. That's one easy strategy. You also need to figure out, um, I lost my thought here. So there's, you need information to contact them and permission, but then you can also um, let them know what's available to them. And, and that can be, again, in a home mailing or on some sort of a portal and let them know specifically how they can access the information because sometimes it's really confusing. I know with my husband's wellness programs and his offerings, most of the time you have to have an employee login in order for me to access the whole portal. And so that's not available to me, but there isn't a spouse portal. So I don't know how to access the thing. So I think it's really important to be thinking about how do we contact people and get permission to reach out to them? How do we let them know what's available to them? Because sometimes that's unclear, but then also creating family offerings, offerings that are designed for the whole family to participate. A super easy one that's been used in the past is on-site health fairs or well-being affairs where the whole family is invited. It's a family-friendly event and it provides the information in a celebratory atmosphere for here are the services that are available to you. You can come and get a flu shot. You can find out what your blood pressure is and then you can find out what programs and services are available to you. So those are a couple of different strategies to engage spouses. Thank you so much. That's that's fantastic. So a couple questions I have from Cindy. Um, who has been very engaged. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so she's asking about vendor churn. So sometimes uh, it's, um, you know, employers have to hire multiple vendors, um, perhaps uh, because maybe they don't experience enough of what their employees, families, dependents experience. So they change vendors. Um, I, I would add that employers do bring multiple vendors uh, especially larger employers, right? Um, some uh, is the implementation of wellness, others maybe for disease management. I think you mentioned diabetes management, et cetera. Uh, some employers have second opinion. Some others have uh, care navigation. So taking all of these together, do you have any suggestions for specific performance metrics that employers might use across multiple vendors? Because it is very difficult when you start from the very beginning to just start with new data. Um, so what are some of the metrics that we can look throughout uh, the continuum of vendors and as we as we potentially are looking at new vendors to bring into into the employer? Yeah, that's such a good question. And again, this could be a very long <laughs> discussion, but I think, you know, one thing is is to make sure you have a measurement and evaluation strategy for your initiatives that does not rely solely on vendor reports. Um, you know, it's it's easy to do that because they're they're offering reporting, um, but that can make it a challenge when when you change or when the vendor changes because sometimes the vendor changes the platform they're using and they lose access to data or something. So I think it's important to have a measurement and evaluation strategy that is very intentional and it is separate from your vendor strategy. And some of the different measures you can be looking at. Um, obviously, there's tapping into claims data that could be um, workers' comp, medical claims to give you the big outcomes. How are we doing on our health? How are we doing on utilization? Obviously. But when it comes to things like participation and engagement, it's a little more challenging. And I think, you know, one of the, the hardest things that you have to do, but I think it's really effective, is to develop uh, some type of an integrated system that allows the data to flow 
from these different partners into an integrated data warehouse. And I've seen some organizations, if it's just participation kinds of data that is not necessarily HIPAA, they can actually create sort of a, a HIPAA friendly space where somebody in the organization can collect that data and pool it all together and start to look at how many people are participating in more, more than one thing and what are the overlaps between exposures to different programs. An even better strategy is to have an independent third party who specializes in data warehousing and integration to do that for you. It is resource intense to do this, but that is probably the best way if you anticipate making a lot of changes um, with your vendors over time or you have a lot of different partners. Investing in those types of strategies are really important and it does help to be looking at things like participation but we also want to get a sense for our employees actually liking what they get. And this is where employee surveys can be really helpful. Um, it, it, you can actually ask an employee, these were the offerings. What did you participate in? Or how much did you like what offerings were available to you? Or you could ask, do the programs and services that are being offered, are they helping you to feel more supported by the organization? Do you feel like your manager or supervisor supports your health and well-being? These are all questions you can add to an employee survey that are independent of what's going on with vendors, but help you get a sense more generally of what people are finding helpful. And then you can always provide some sort of a feedback loop and say, you know, if you have feedback about a specific supplier and the programs you're participating in, share your testimonials with us, share your stories about what's effective about that. And sometimes those things can help. I also know that on surveys, you can ask things like, um, you know, to what extent do you feel like your health is improved as a result of the offerings that are being provided to you? Um, so that can give you, again, just a general marker of how you're doing success-wise. Thank you for that. You also talked about virtual digital health. Um, you see, do you see a, a standalone uh, digital health products being a major player in uh, health and wellness? Absolutely. Um, I think with um, employees now experiencing more access because they, they sort of had to, <laughs> to health and, health and well-being services, um, they're starting to get more comfortable with digital services. And I think we're seeing a lot of players come in and say they offer digital types of offerings. I think one of the ones that most intrigued me was an organization called Hinge Health, and this isn't necessarily an endorsement, it's just an example. But they offer assessments so that employees can know how am I doing in terms of my ergonomic setup. And they offer musculoskeletal conditioning programs that they can participate in one-on-one -on -one with um, somebody on video. So I think that there are a lot of specialized offerings that are now popping up to help bring access to people who didn't have access to it before. I think obviously this is a challenge if you have an employee population that doesn't have a computer at home or they don't have a strong internet signal. These are still challenges for people. Um, if you have um, some sort of uh, an on-site offering where people can come into say an on-site health clinic or an on-site wellness space, you can put a kiosk in where people can come and take advantage of some of those digital offerings as part of their on-site workday or they can do it, um, even if they're working from home, they can come in and use it. And you know, maybe, maybe that's by appointment or something. But I think that digital offerings are here to stay. I think they're getting better and higher quality. And now the challenge is, how do we make sure people feel comfortable with that technology, that they feel like their privacy is being protected and they understand how to use those services? Thank you. We do have a lot more questions. I know as I'm reading the questions uh, on the screen in front of me, I know you've answered most of them. I will ask one last question because we need to get to our panel. Uh, and, and as you said, Jessica, uh, you and I and our audience, we can be discussing this for another three hours. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll, um, we'll do a, a, a round two uh, because this is just so interesting and so important as well. But I would like to ask, the last question I would like to bring um, to your attention is specific to engaging uh, people in, their, in, in mental health services. Uh, you did mention that um, absolutely this is, uh, I think COVID uh, has put a, um, de definitely a big light on uh, mental health um, wellness. 
and um, any any thoughts about how to engage people um, in their in, in their wellness, their mental health wellness? Yes, and there's actually, if you go out to the Health Enhancement Research Organization, um, they have a free resource, a fantastic one that was years in development um, called the Employee Mental Health and Wellbeing Emerging Best Practices and Case Study Examples. If you go out to hero-health.org forward slash resources, I believe you should be able to get access to this. Um, but they had six best practices when it comes to encouraging mental health and well-being. And one is just raising awareness about the importance of it, normalizing the conversation so that people understand everybody, everybody is dealing with mental and emotional well-being issues. It doesn't matter if you're the highest level leader in an organization or if you're a frontline employee um, living in an urban setting. It, everybody is struggling with the issues that we're seeing nationally. So I think normalizing the conversation, destigmatizing is a big start. And then making sure people are aware of what's available to them. And I think part of it is if there are signals that you can get in your data where you can understand, oh, it looks like somebody has a prescription that might be related to anxiety, let's make sure that they're aware of the programs and services available to them. And that means often partnering with some of your other suppliers, your health insurer, say, you know, look, here are some offerings that are available to you, maybe from another provider, but making sure that people are aware of those things. And that often requires venture integration, but I think that's really, really important. Um, and then I think in terms of some of the other best practices they had here is if you can integrate some things together. So when you're talking about weight management, for example, hello, comfort eating, <laughs> that's a mental and emotional well-being issues. They're using food to cope integrating that into your, your weight management solutions is a way to start introducing the idea of mental and emotional well-being has a role to play on our physical health too. So if you can integrate some of these concepts together, I think it can really help. So this was fantastic. Again, I don't want to leave you. I want to stay here and talk to you more. So I'm, I'm thinking and Jennifer, who is also in our in our circle here helping me with a webinar, uh, we need to do a part two, Jen. Um, I want to thank you. Um, everybody, uh, Jessica joined us very early. She's in California. I think that's why she mentioned uh, water sports uh, and not ice sports or skiing. Uh, thank you so very much, Jessica. And I want to see you again very, very soon. Thank you. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing two employers with whom I am working very closely regularly. I would like to ask Jake Nolan and uh, Wendy Whitehead to join me on screen um, and uh, while I'm introducing them. So Jake Nolan is the Vice President of Human Resources for Rice Lake Weighing Systems. Jake uh, joined Rice Lake Weighing Systems in 2011. He's focusing on providing, truly providing high value healthcare for his organization. Prior to his current role, um, Jake was uh, the human resources leader. Uh, he had positions at Fortune Brands, New Old Rubbermaid, and uh, GKN. Uh, tons of credentials, and I want to mention them because they're so important. So he holds an MBA in human resources management, a master's degree in business law. He's certified as a senior professional in human resources. He's a master trainer for mission-directed work teams and a master facilitator for investment in excellence and thought patterns for high performance. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Jake on our um, Alliance Board of Directors since 2020, and he is actually serving as our vice chair. So welcome, Jake. I would like to also welcome Wendy Whitehead, who is the Director of Rewards and HR Service Delivery for Quick Trip Inc. Wendy joined uh, Quick Trip in 1999, uh, she started as the HR intern and held various HR, employment, recruiting, uh, benefit design positions before uh, becoming the director of rewards and HR service delivery in 19, 2019. So in her role, she provides strategic leadership and direction for several HR teams comprising of more than 50 professionals who are responsible for benefits, payroll, HRIS, and an and HR call center. In addition to this impressive career at Quick Trip, she also has lots of credentials and she's so active in her community, professional and um, community, uh, geographic community as well. She's board chair for the First Community Credit Union and has professional affiliations with the Lacrosse Society, 
for Human Resources, uh, La Crosse Sherm, the Society for uh, Human Resource Management, the International Foundation of Employee Benefit Plans, uh, and the Wisconsin Early Childhood, sorry, forgive me, uh, the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association Business Advisory Council. It's all so impressive and so um, so difficult to say it all. So Wendy uh, currently serves as the Alliance Health Policy, uh, Policy Committee, and she also joined uh, our board of directors this year. So thank you both, welcome. Um, I'm gonna start by giving you an opportunity and asking you each to talk about your programs for a few minutes, and then we'll get into questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Jake, would you like to go first? Sure, <clears throat> thank you, Melina, and thanks for having me. Um, and uh, thanks to Dr. Grossmeyer. Um, that was riveting. Um, a, you know, a lot of new ideas for me and some confirmation of some of the things that we have done and had success with. So uh, thanks uh, for that. Um, for Rice Lake Wang Systems, um, you know, we started our journey a long time ago. And like so many of you, we started out uh, with fully insured health plans and the year over year double digit increases. And, uh, and we went through all that drama and uh, finally decided uh, in 2015 to uh, to make some changes. Um, we used 2015 and 2016 um, to plan, um, <clears throat> communicate, and educate our workforce. And one of my favorite stories is um, I was I was the working title for our health plan was uh, I was calling it Healthy Choices, and I, I'd called that for a couple of years. And our uh, president and owner finally one day he said, "Stop calling it that." And I'm like, why? What's wrong with that? I think it's kind of catchy. He said, it sounds like a loaf of bread. So um, I said, well, what, what are we going to call it? We, we, we have to call it something. And he said, he's like, I don't know. I'm like, well, what do you want people to do? And he's like, I want people to take control of their health. I said, what did you say? And he said, I want people to take control of their health. So we have the take control of your health plan. Um, true story. And, um, you know, when I think about how do we engage our employees and uh, the things that we do um, and the things that we do well, um, and a lot of it has been by trial and error, uh, but healthcare consumerism um, is, uh, is at the top of the list. It's how do you create a group of members uh, and make it important to them to be good healthcare consumers? That's the first step to engagement. Uh, I think a lot of organizations, uh, including us at the beginning, I think we got it wrong. Um, we were thinking about it in terms of what's in it for the organization, and we had to flip that on its head and say, what's in it for our members? What's important to them? What do they value? And so that's our approach to consumerism. Um, the second thing is uh, direct primary care. Um, so we have our own um, Cedar Ridge uh, <coughs> Health Center uh, for our employees, and, uh, and we did that because uh, we wanted to have uh, good old-fashioned health care. Uh, we wanted, uh, we didn't want 15-minute appointments. We wanted uh, our members to have relationships with our providers, ongoing long-term relationships, and, um, you know, our, some of our providers will make house calls. Um, <laughs> one of our providers phoned in a prescription last night at nine o'clock uh, uh, for one of our uh, teammates who was visiting from out of town. Um, that kind of uh, commitment to our uh, to our members, uh, which is fantastic. Um, plan design is really important. Um, it's, it's in the background. It's for, you know, us, the HR professionals usually, um, but that needs to be supported by human resources, our front line of defense. So all of our HR uh, practitioners are um, extremely well versed. They're subject matter experts in our benefits and um, in particular, our health plan. Uh, we have partners in care navigation through Alethius and um, and then obviously uh, uh, working with the Alliance on Contracted Care um, and uh, all those things put together to kind of shape up our plan design. Um, and last but not least, um, the focus on long-term health outcomes. That is something that when we originally started uh, thinking about the uh, Take Control of Your Health Plan, what do we want? Um, what we really want is long-term health outcomes. That's good for our members. That's good for our organization. That's good for our community. That's good for our partners. Um, and so something that we uh, try to keep in the, um, in the front of our mind. 
And um, listening to uh, Dr. Grossmeyer, um, I jotted down a note and um, maybe you will want to too. Uh, it's a truism that we find. I use it often in, uh, in training and uh, coaching and other things that I do. Um, the truism is those who need it most want it least. And when you're talking about engaging employees in their health care, the, the person that goes out and runs five miles every day is probably not the one that you need to spend your time and resources on. Um, it's the one that doesn't want to come to meetings, that doesn't respond to surveys, uh, that doesn't uh, participate in the wellness uh, program. And how can you reach out and engage that person? Thank you, Jake. We'll come back to that. Uh, that's very important. Thank you. Wendy, uh, may I ask you to join us and uh, talk a little bit about your programs? Sure. Um, so here at Quick Trip, we've had a, a, a wellness program for quite some time. It, it started out um, as a participatory program where you just participated and then you got like a gift card or something of that nature. And over time, we evolved that to be an outcomes-based program, and we transitioned it to be um, the, the reward is a discount on your, your health premium. So it's now a pretty significant award. Um, you save about $1,100 on your health premiums if you're in the single um, tier, and if you're in family coverage, you're saving about $3,100. And um, Jessica's um, presentation really resonated with myself as well, because we followed that trend that she mentioned. Um, our participation has been dwindling over time, which is very interesting. And so I, I plan on taking a look at some of those research studies and such that she talked about to see um, what we might need to do to enhance it. Because it's one of those things where we've had this program in place for a few years now and haven't done a lot to, to tweak it and change it. And I think it's time we probably need to, to mix it up a little bit. Um, so with our wellness program today, um, like I said, it is outcomes-based. So coworkers need to complete a medical health questionnaire. That's what our um, on-site health clinics um, used to help assess the risk in our health population. Um, they then also have to do a biometric screening and they get points if they are in healthy categories for their blood pressure, their glucose, their BMI, um, their cholesterol, et cetera. And with any wellness program, you have to be able to provide alternatives to those um, that don't meet those outcomes. And so there's a wide variety of other ways that people can earn points alternatively. So we, we this year we gave points for getting a COVID vaccine. We give points for getting your, um, your annual dental cleaning. We actually have a really low participation rate for preventative care exams on our, our dental plan. Um, and so we were trying to incentivize people to utilize that benefit as well. Um, we give points for doing mammograms. Um, we give points for um, participating in our maternity management program, getting a vision exam, flu shots. Um, and then we also have some different uh, challenges that our health centers um, put together for our population. So they include things like sleep, challenges, um, mindfulness challenges, we've done minutes of physical activity, and usually what we do is we take a look at those risk assessments to determine what kinds of things do we want to be focusing on with our population. We've actually found that um, we have a lot of depression in our population, and sleep is a really big thing for our population too, so um, we try to mix it up based off of what we're seeing on those risk scores of what they complete. Um, some of the other things that we've tried to do over time, uh, we have a diabetic management program. And so what we're doing with that program is those that participate in the diabetes management program and they are testing their um, blood sugars, we've been offering free diabetes medication to those uh, that population. Um, we just enhanced that program when we switched to a new vendor this past summer. Um, so that it's not just free insulin that we're giving out now, it's, it's other um, diabetic medication as well, because not everybody that has diabetes has to take insulin. And so um, we're trying to encourage them to engage in behaviors to help keep their diabetes under control. So um, they need to do things like if they engage with a, a diabetes um, care coach or education specialist, if they're logging their glucose, logging their weight, um, taking pictures of their food for their food log, um, tracking their medication, there's different activity levels that they, they meet 
um, each month to ensure that they get that um, free diabetes medication. Um, we also have a, a wide variety of non-incentive um, wellness programs that we implement as well. Um, so in addition to our three employee health clinics that we operate, we have one in La Crosse where we're headquartered. We have another one in Appleton, Wisconsin, and a third one in Middleton, Wisconsin. Um, and at those different facilities, we'll actually bring um, mobile mammograms and we'll do skin cancer screenings, um, blood pressure clinics. Um, here on the campus, um, we actually have some of our clinic providers going out to our production areas and our distribution center and into our office areas to actually engage with our coworkers to get them to participate in those types of screening events. Um, and then we do also try to do a lot of different types of education for our coworkers. Usually that's in the, the form of videos. We have our own audio visual department. And so we've been able to have our providers do different educational programs, whether it's on mental health awareness, um, where to, to seek out um, resources for, for mental health. Um, we did a video um, on colon cancer screening and education on, on why it's important to make sure you're you're getting um, your colon cancer screenings done. Um, and then similar to what Jake had mentioned, we also do have a care navigation program here at Quick Trip as well. Um, just because we have so many vendors, it's, it's hard enough for me um, being involved in benefits to keep track of each vendor and who does what. It was a, a mess for our plan participants to try to figure out, well, I have a question on this, who am I supposed to call? Um, so we did implement a, a care navigation benefit about a year ago um, to give coworkers that one place to, to reach out to get um, assistance for all the things related to our health plan. So it's a, a high level overview of what we do here. Thank you, Wendy. And Jake, Wendy mentioned a little bit about incentives. Uh, do you at uh, Rice Lake Wing Systems, do you offer incentives? Do you use the, uh, the benefit plan to engage employees? Uh, what are your specific tactics? Oh, Jake, I think you're muted. Sorry. Good. I didn't start <laughs> out very well. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, three different types of incentives. Um, uh, Cedar Ridge Health Center itself is an incentive. It is a, a no-cost uh, direct primary care, acute care, chronic disease management uh, and wellness facility. Um, they do some, um, uh, depending on the provider, uh, in-office procedures there and those kinds of things. There is no cost um, to our members uh, whatsoever for, uh, for anything that they receive at the health center, including prescription medications. Uh, we have some dur durable medical equipment for, um, for use um, and sometimes uh, that we uh, will provide. Um, those kinds of things, crutches, um, blood pressure, cuffs, those uh, different uh, types of things. So um, uh, so all of that at no cost to our, um, our members. Uh, and don't underestimate um, the value of no cost. Uh, our, our members really appreciate it. They can't believe that they don't have to pay for anything when they go there. They can't believe that they don't have to pay more uh, on the health plan uh, to be able to, to do that. Um, and you know and include their spouses and and their uh, children that are on the plan uh, it's a really great benefit um another thing that we do um <clears throat> is well first we haven't had a uh an employee cost increase uh in seven years um and we have credit to the last five years to the plan um so there haven't been any cost increases but we've also offered uh, a 15 percent discount off of the the employee cost the employee contribution cost um, if they, uh, the adult members on the plan go to the health center uh, once a year, at least once a year, and for our remote employees, um, any uh, physical exam, wellness exam, um, uh, you know, general appointment uh, will uh, satisfy that requirement. Um, and we have had 97% uh, of all of our eligible members uh, in Wisconsin have uh, visited our health center at least once. The last thing that we do is um, part of our plan design. And uh, like I think a lot of you, uh, we have some uh, bundled contracts and uh, so that uh, our members can go and with no deductible and no coinsurance, 
uh, and get services, get a colonoscopy, get a knee replacement. Um, and if you go to a tier one uh, provider for us, um, so again, that um, we're not paying people above, we're not uh, you know giving them $500 to go do this, but if you go do this, then you no know deductible, no co-insurance. Um, and then the rest of our plan is tiered uh, up from there, uh, deductible and co-insurance goes up uh, to a fifth tier that's out of network. So those are the three primary ways that we incentivize uh, our members. Thank you, Jake. Wendy, would you like to talk a little bit about more, a little more, because I know you've mentioned some of your incentives already, um, a little more about your incentives? Sure. Um, so I already mentioned the free diabetic medication for those that participate and engage with the diabetes management program, the health premium discounts. Um, we we have two um, health plan options here at QuickTrip. One is a low deductible health plan and one is a high deductible health plan with a health savings account. Because we offer the health savings account, that at times um, handcuffs us a little bit with what we're able to do with the plan designed for the high deductible health plan. Um, but what we have done on the low deductible health plan is any of those um, plan participants are able to use all the services at our Quick Trip Centers for Health for free. We don't charge any type of copay for any type of visit, whereas those um, who are on the high deductible health plan, they do have a copay that they have to pay so that we're in compliance with the, the HSA rules. Um, the other thing that we're doing similar to what Jake and his organization are doing is we um, just started to offer cash incentives for um, plan participants that utilize certain centers of excellences for either a colonoscopy or an MRI, knee hip replacement, and some other types of select surgeries with um, centers of excellences that we've partnered with. Um, we just announced that um, starting in January, and I just got a report to do our first incentive payout for an MRI, which is very exciting. So awesome. we're, we're excited to kind of go down this path where we're starting to incentivize um, people actually shopping for healthcare and rewarding them for selecting a low cost, high quality provider. So yeah, so uh, we got a question. So I want to mention to um, everybody, both uh, Quick Trip Inc. and Rice Lake Wing Systems, they're both self-funded health plans. So both Jake and uh, Wendy are managing um, self-funded self -funded health plans. And that is what really allows them some of the flexibility to do some of the things, the incredible things that they are uh, discussing here, including offering um, free care or very low cost care, which is fantastic. So I'm going to stay on that um, on that idea and and really um, dive in a little bit more on your DPC. I know you both have on-site, near-site clinics. Um, I don't know if everybody heard when they said uh, QuickTrip is a larger employer. Uh, so Quick Trip has three um, clinics, near site clinics across Wisconsin, and of course Jake for his um, for your um, Wisconsin population, you have an on site clinic as well. So let's dive a little bit more on the direct primary care. Um, what kind of adoption have you seen um, from your employees and their families uh, coming into your clinic? Um, and I'll just start with Jake, if that's okay. <clears throat> well, I was there yesterday to pick up a prescription for my wife and got a hug before I left. So um, they've um, they've become like family. Um, we stumbled a little bit out of the gate uh, with our first uh, clinic partner, and uh, that we ch we changed partners about three years ago, um, and it has uh, it's been the best thing uh, that we've done. And um, we now work with Neopath Health and. Uh, um, they provide the back room for us and uh, have have been a fantastic partner, but it really uh, boils down to the providers. And um, right now we have a, a doctor, uh, a DMP and a PA uh, 48 hours a week. And um, so there's, uh, there's plenty of access. We didn't want our members to have to wait um, a long time for an appointment. Um, and so um, we're out about uh, two to three days right now, um, and we have about 85% utilization uh, of our available uh, uh, appointments. And um, another thing that we did was change um, from 20-minute appointments 
um, to 30 or 60 minute appointments, depending on what the appointment is for. Um, so that it will allow for plenty of time. Um, and uh, as our utilization went up, we added the, uh, the third provider and uh, continuing to add services, um, uh, trying to find some other ways to utilize the health center. We do um, some Ahmed, uh, we do pre-employment uh, drug testing, pre-employment physicals, uh, post-accident, um, and we do some uh, minor acute care for workers' comp. And uh, so um, it's been great. And um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, uh, for every dollar that we put into the health center, we, we get uh, at least one back in uh, savings, if not uh, two or more. So um, it is, uh, it's been a huge success for us. So before I go to Wendy, I, I want to stay on what you said, Jake. Uh, so a couple things. First of all, great teachable moment. Uh, you had some, um, you know, not so good moments initially when you first launched your on-site clinic, your direct primary care um, clinic, uh, but you persevered, you insisted, you knew that that was the the right strategy. Um, and, and from what I heard, I, mean, I know from your CEO, um, changing healthcare for your employees is very, very important. Uh, controlling healthcare is very important for him and for you and your team. How do you sell your ideas to your leadership? I, no. I don't have to. Um, it's our third highest cost. Uh, um, our, our benefits uh, are our third highest cost. And our, um, our owner and president sit uh, on our um, on our benefits committee, as well as our CFO, and um, um, they're um, they're very engaged. It's very important uh, to them, uh, and not just from a, a financial standpoint, but they uh, truly do care about our employees and our workforce, uh, you know, and uh, and our other members. It's a small community, and um, you know, uh, it, it was not hard, Melina. That is awesome. That's but leadership. But what you're telling us is that leadership participation and the culture is very important. And it's very consistent with what um, Dr. Grossmeyer was telling us as well. Uh, Wendy, what about you? Um, both questions for you. So um, talk to us about the adoption you've seen uh, in your on-site clinics or sorry, near-site clinics, DPC. And also, how are you selling your ideas to your leadership? Um, what is that process? What does it look like? Sure. So the interesting thing that Quick Trip does with their health clinics is they're not just utilized by coworkers on our health plan. We let coworkers that are not on our health plan use them too. Um, as a retailer, the our workforce is predominantly part time, and they don't qualify to be on our health coverage because a lot of them are working anywhere from ten to twenty hours a week, but we, we need a, a large workforce that's able to fill in for those those evening, weekend hours, et cetera. And so we're actually leveraging our clinics as a recruitment and a retention tool for our part-time population as well. Um, so when we do reporting, I'm kind of doing two sets of, of reporting because um, the ROI that I'm getting, I'm, I'm really the ROI that I get is the savings um, in redirected care. And so I do have to have our vendor part, um, report also on the metrics just for those that are on our health plan to get a, an idea of what we're truly saving um, because the visits being done by those not on our health plan are actually adding some extra expense. Um, to the organization, but we view that as a, a good recruitment retention tool. And one of the things that we're um, trying to work on right now with our vendor is to get numbers on that. Um, our part-time coworkers that are engaging with our clinic, do they stay with our organization longer? And so that's one of the things that we're currently working on exploring. Um, of those that are on our health plan um, in the lacrosse area, about 50% um, of them do engage with our, our clinic um, at least uh, every one to eight, one year to 18 months. Um, it is a benefit that is very easy for us to um, communicate here in our in La Crosse where we're headquartered. Um, we have offices, we have a food production facilities, we have distribution center, and then we've got about a thousand co-workers that work in the stores around in La Crosse area. So when you're that geographic area is really easy to communicate with. It does get a lot more challenging to communicate with our coworkers out in the Appleton and Middleton areas because they're spread out through 
um, a large number of stores and our turnover at retail is higher. And so we have to make a more cognizant effort to be constantly communicating um, to those groups out at retail to make sure that we're driving people who are on our health plan to utilize our clinics so that we can see the savings there. Um, as far as like the, the different types of services that we have, um, we obviously offer primary care, um, preventative care, acute care visits. We also have physical therapy in La Crosse and Middleton. Um, that has resulted in quite a, a bit of work comp savings for us in the La Crosse area, especially for our production and distribution and transportation teams. Um, we also a couple of years ago added behavioral health counseling um, here in La Crosse because we found that the community just wasn't able to meet the needs of our coworkers and their dependents. Um, people were on six month or more wait lists to get into counseling. Um, and we reached our capacity and we're now in the process of hiring um, another behavioral health counselor so that we can offer that through all three of our centers and then we'll be offering virtual behavior health counseling as well. Um, and as far as like your question about how, how to sell the ideas, um, I'm a little bit lucky here because um, uh, we're a family owned company and a couple of the Zietlow family members are actually physicians at Rochester in, May, in Mayo. Um, and so they, they're the family that owns us is very familiar with the challenges of healthcare and the importance of caring. Um, they understand population health and things like that. So it's, it is fairly easy for me to sell those kinds of things. Now my boss is not <laughs> um, in healthcare. And so sometimes it can be a little bit challenging to, to kind of pitch and sell those ideas for him. Um, but I think a lot of it kind of ties back into um, making sure that the programs that we have are reinforcing our culture of caring about our coworkers, that our coworkers are caring for our guests. Um, and then just making sure that you have the, the ROI numbers. Um, that's another important one to make sure you've got some hard numbers that you're not just relying on some of the, the fluffy nice to have things. Um, you, you have to make sure you have some hard numbers to support what you're doing. So Wendy, thank you. I, I will stay with you because you have a very unique situation. Not only your um, your workforce is um, across a relatively large geography, not in Wisconsin, but in other states as well, but you also have, and you mentioned it, you have stores where you will have four to, I don't know, four to six to eight employees. You have uh, truck drivers. So there is a lot of diversity uh, in terms of what your workforce, where they live and what they do. How do you uh, best communicate with them? We had a question earlier that I did not have a chance to ask Dr. Crossmeyer about distribution centers, but it, it, it's along those lines when you have such different, um, such diversity in what your employees do and where they live um, that it, I guess uh, it will be, it is challenging communicating with all. How do you do it? Well, we have to do a lot of it. Um, you have to do it repeatedly and, and hope what sticks. Um, the other thing that we've tried to do is um, partner with some of our safety champions that we have out at retail and in our production and distribution area. Safety is a, a really big initiative at Quick Trip. Um, and so what we did is we partnered with um, those teams to turn those safety champions into um, safety and wellness champions as well so that we have people out in our stores um, that are, of course, they're communicating with everyone in their, their area about the well, uh, safety initiatives and then they're incorporating some of these wellness conversations and information as well. Um, because when HR sends stuff out, who's gonna you know, read all that stuff. Oh, HR is just sending something else out again, but it's a little bit different when, oh, that's Bob. You know, Bob comes around and, and helps me with these different things at the, the store. I know Bob, they're more apt to listen to um, those that they know and have a relationship with. So we've tried to, to work with that network. The other thing that we um, have done a lot of is, is different types of uh, videos. We try to keep them short um, and push them out to our coworkers through our um, learning management system, where whether that's myself or a vendor partner or one of our providers um, will push out educational med messages 
about every other month or so um, to our, our store leadership and then our health plan participants. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Wendy. Um, and Jake, just to clarify, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this statement, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong. Jake, you only have um, a, a coinsurance copay plan, right? You don't have an HDHP, Correct. an HSA plan. Correct. Excellent. Yeah, somebody was asking it. I knew the answer, but um, I wanted to make sure that I was not wrong. So, um, last question then for you all. Um, and, and this is kind of a, a little bit of a longer question, um, but I think it's again, one of these teachable moments. And I am so thrilled that employers and their brokers are recognizing uh, the persistency, the perseverance in this journey. It's not a once uh, and done. So the question uh, that we got is that uh, some employers are trying a single lunch to learn a seminar. They sort of call it a day after that. Uh, when they don't see the results they're hoping for, they throw their hands up and they think their employees will never become engaged. Of course, we all know that that's not the case. Uh, Jessica uh, mentioned this ongoing communication. You both are mentioning this, this ongoing, uh, actually, um, Jake, you said that you walked into your clinic and this is family. So this is kind of the connection and the ongoing communication and connection that you're all developing. Um, so, what is that maybe a little more of what does that ongoing communication look like for you how often are employees being communicated and in what ways um and jake i'll start first with you all right so i showed you our our binder but it really starts um it started a few weeks ago planning for 2023 um and so uh you know everything that's set in motion for 2022 um, is, is already going, it's already working. Um, we've already communicated it. Um, we're just out reinforcing it. Now we're planning for 2023. We'll have all our decisions for 2023 made by, um, you know, late summer. Um, and then we'll go into preparing for uh, open enrollment season. And uh, we go to extraordinary lengths with our uh, with our members every year. Uh, COVID obviously presented some challenges, but we uh, we developed some new tools and uh, uh, really learned how to utilize Zoom uh, in a lot of different ways. And um, but uh, we'll have uh, uh, individual meetings uh, with every new hire uh, for benefits uh, when just before they become benefits eligible, so that you're <coughs> setting the right tone from the very beginning uh, when they're making those elections. Then we get into open enrollment and we always have uh, employee meetings. Um, we offer one-on-ones um, and uh, we uh, offer meetings with spouses. Uh, spouses are, are the most difficult um, to access and to, uh, to educate and thus they become for us uh, one of our largest uh, expense areas uh, because the information either isn't getting home or it isn't sinking in and um you know we we see it time and again you know go and have a knee replacement at a high cost uh health center um and then they find out afterwards that they could have had it done for uh, no cost to them and uh they're just you know beside themselves but they say i didn't know um so we you know we send mailings home uh directly to spouses um and uh, offer a lot of support in, in that area. Post open enrollment, we send a confirmation, uh, digital confirmation to, uh, to the employee to make sure that what they signed up for is what they wanted. And that's another great opportunity for us to uh, share other information on the plan. And then we wrap it all up with a, um, a total compensation statement that goes out with uh, W-2s uh, every year. and. Um, and then the cycle starts again. Um, we are fortunate to have a, uh, a phenomenal marketing department um, at Rice Lake Wang Systems, and uh, they're very engaged uh, and they help us with all our materials um, that we have. And so we <clears throat> spend a lot of time and effort on these things um, for education, for information, and um, send. This is a refrigerator magnet, one of the best things we've ever done. So 
you know, the numbers at home, the email addresses at home, they know exactly what they need to do. They don't have to pull out a file. They know exactly what it is. And uh, so those are some of the things that we do. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Wendy, same question to you um, in, in our finale of today's uh, webinar. I also would like to add for you, Wendy, if I may, um, do you get employee feedback? Do you do surveys to get employee feedback uh, of how well your wellness programs work? So for the feedback piece, no, we don't at this point in time. And after hearing Jessica's presentation, um, that is something I, I do want to do. And I because I think I'm I'm very curious to find out what what are some of our barriers of participation and what are things that we can do um, to encourage more engagement and participation and things like that. But no, we're we're not currently doing that at this point in time. Um, we do um, our clinic partner does do surveys that they send out following visits and such, and they'll share um, the um, scores of those results with us in our annual reviews and such but we don't do that for our wellness program right now um, as far as like the communications and the timeline thing very similar to jake's organization we follow that same kind of timeline we'll have everything figured out by summer currently we were already communicating our wellness program for this year so that we can get people completing their activities and getting their biometric screenings and such done um, there is some type of wellness um, or health communication that, that goes out um, at least monthly. Sometimes it's more frequently than that. We actually have a, a communication calendar and plan um, where we know ahead of time for the year what types of um, messages we want to touch on because otherwise it's so easy to lose sight of um, what you want to focus on and communicate on. So we try to have those communications planned out about a year in advance. Um, we have some things that we do a little different at the support center versus our stores. So in our break rooms, we have um, display boards, electronic display boards. We'll put messaging on there. We'll do table tents, we'll do posters. Um, we actually have representatives from the benefits team can actually go over to some of those department meetings and present on topics and get in front of our coworkers. Um, so that gives them an opportunity to ask questions and get engaged a little bit more. Um, we do mail our wellness booklets to um, our coworkers' homes. We do the benefit statement type of thing as well. Um, and we also do send um, emails out to coworkers' personal email addresses that we have on file with information and reminders and things like that. So that's kind of a, a summary. Well, so thank you both very, very much. Our audience loves hearing from employers. Thank you for your time. I know it's all very time consuming. You had to prepare, so thank you for your time. Thank you on behalf of the Alliance for allowing us to be one of your partners and helping you. Um, I have some announcements, so please stay with me for just a couple more minutes. Uh, Dr. Jessica Grossmeyer, Grossmeyer, who I know you're still with us, thank you so very much. Really excellent presentation. Uh, our panelists, of course, uh, fantastic employers. Um, everyone who attended and asked questions today, I thank you. You will receive an email following today's event with a short survey and directions on how to apply for CE credits. Uh, so please complete the survey that helps us become better. Uh, I want to remind everybody of a few things. First of all, uh, our Healthcare Transformation Awards are coming up. Uh, we're sending emails and asking you to nominate uh, for our Healthcare Transformation Awards. If you or someone you know is drastically improving healthcare delivery, or like we talked about it today, using unique methods to improve your employee engagement, please, please, please consider nominating yourself to win this award you can submit a nomination from our website's page. Uh, the winners will be announced at the Fall Symposium and Annual Meeting on October 25th. Uh, so be sure to mark your calendars for that. That's an event a few months from now. Prior to that, to that event, we will have several actually this year. It will be a very busy year for the marketing department and uh, the Alliance in general. Uh, our second webinar is coming up on March 24th. And we will be discussing surprise billing and out-of-network charges and how to best protect your plan first and your employees and their families against these, um, these charges um, as well. Then on May 23rd, we will have our spring symposium. And I'm so excited to say May 23rd spring symposium. This will be the first event we will be offering in person and virtually. Um, 
hopefully that's going to be the first time we will come together in person since COVID uh, changed, completely changed the way we conduct businesses. So uh, mark your calendar for May 23rd. The annual RAND uh, study results will be presented. And we're also working on some very hot, very relevant topics to present and discuss with you. So uh, with that, uh, that is all from us today. Thank you as always for the privilege of your time.